Hi everybody, my name is Davide and I am a DevOps architect at Microsoft and GitHub. And I'm also a technical content creator. In fact, I have a YouTube channel called Coder Dave where I talk about DevOps. In my role as DevOps architect, I get to work with the biggest, most important and most strategic client for Microsoft and GitHub in Asia and Oceania and I work on their DevOps transformations. And as you know, DevOps is a very broad term. So when I say that I work on that DevOps transformation, the actual meaning of that really depends on the clients. Some companies, in fact, want to focus more on technical aspects like CI/CD, branching strategies, testing, automations, etc., while others perhaps prefer taking a more theoretical approach and discuss about processes, methodologies, cultural changes, and other things like that. But regardless of the approach, more and more often, I work with those companies on the security aspect of DevOps, what we usually refer to as DevSecOps. Now, even though DevSecOps is a buzzword that we hear constantly, I don't usually call it like that. And the reason is very simple. Giving it a different name makes it feels like it's something optional, something one can decide when and even if to adopt, when in reality it's not exactly like that. Let me explain. We all know this diagram, this is the classic DevOps representation, but if you look closer though, you will notice that there is no mention of anything security in it. This is why companies often operate in this way, having security completely detached from anything else, siloed and pulled in after the fact, usually when the pieces of software have already been deployed. I hope we all agree that this is not a good practice, and in fact other companies too realize that it is not how you should operate, so they bring security closer to the other teams and practices and they call it DevSecOps. While this is certainly better than the previous model we've seen, I still have a problem with it. Because now, yes, security is closer to the other teams, they may have better visibility on what's happening during deployment, during development, during testing, but they are still operating by themselves, uh, somewhat siloed, and uh, they are fully responsible still of anything security. And this is what makes it not a very good model. To make it better, to make our software more secure and secured, we have to take this to a step forward. Security needs to be integrated in the whole flow and practiced and applied in every single area, from ideation to coding, from testing to deployment to monitoring. Security everywhere and at any time. This is the key. But how do we get there? Well, this is where things get interesting because there are so many steps that you can and eventually have to take to get better at DevSecOps. And one of the things that is usually recommended first by many people is shifting left on security. But again, we need to do it the right way. This one is the usual legacy starting point in which we don't have integrated security and as I've mentioned before, the first thing companies usually do is adding security after deployment, which means penetration testing, security scanning, bug hunting, etc. perhaps all in production. And don't get me wrong, those things are certainly useful, but finding a security bug in production is not a good thing, it's way too late. In fact, the cost of fixing bugs and security issues increases every time we move right in the next stage of the DevOps flow. And if we are not able to catch them in time because we only apply security after deployment, a breach could be catastrophic. For this reason, we should shift left on security, starting it while in the development phase. But this is not the arrival point, this is just the beginning. As I've mentioned before, we should apply this concept everywhere. This means having security embedded in each and every phase of our iterations. Each phase will require different approaches and tools, but we need to have it there. And to do this, it is just not possible relying on a central isolated security team. We need to change the paradigm and security has to become a responsibility of every person involved. Product owners and PMs have to think about the features with security in mind. Developers have to implement those features respecting the security indications, best practices and guidelines. Testers have to test not only for functionality, but also for security and so on and so forth. You got the point. With that said, let me quickly address the elephant in the room, because every time I talk about those things, I always have the same question. Should we get rid of the security teams? Well, the answer, of course, is not. Uh, even though we change the paradigm and the security becomes a responsibility of everyone else, it doesn't mean that the security team is not important because things like I mentioned before, uh, penetration testing, all the security scanning and so on and so forth are still very important and the security team is the one that should perform them. And also, as I mentioned, the development team should follow best practices and guidelines and who's better uh, to define them than the security team. 
However, security teams have to pivot their role from being the only security-related touchpoint to being a security-focused team helping and supporting all the other functions. And as always in DevOps, with the ultimate goal of having a big cross-functional, cross-discipline team rather than separate teams. And by the way, this is even more important in a cloud-native development model, because even though it's true that you will delegate some of the security parts to your cloud provider, for example, uh, your development and deployment cadence will most likely greatly increase. And uh, so you will need to do security faster, and this model will help you scale. All right, let's talk now about some more concrete practices you can implement to better secure your DevOps. And notice that I didn't say better at that SecOps. So first thing I always recommend is treating the security work as if it were normal work. This means including it in the backlog and work on it during the normal sprints or iterations. This will help your development team, especially in the beginning, getting more familiar with security and technical debt remediation. And also they will not have any excuse not to work on those tasks because they are part of the normal backlog. Of course, if you have any incident or security bug that needs to be remediated immediately, that will get an exception, but this should be the general rule. And once you have it in your backlog, then you should carry it through your whole process. Every time you open up a request, there should be a security scan running for it, and it should block the PR if vulnerabilities are present. This way you stop vulnerable code to reach your default branch. Then have the same scanning in your main CI, meaning the CI on your default branch, for each push or merge. Furthermore, schedule a scan at fixed intervals, perhaps weekly, so you can make sure that your code base is constantly checked, even if you do not commit or merge anything, should new vulnerabilities be discovered in the meantime. Finally, deploy only if all the security tests have passed, and deploy across multiple stages with gates in place to further test for security and vulnerabilities aside from proper functionality. Enabling progressive exposure, like I've just described, will allow you to identify and fix vulnerabilities as quickly as possible, and perhaps even rolling back or rolling forward if needed as quick as possible. And speaking of identifying vulnerabilities, there is a mindset change that can also help you with that. And I'm talking about assuming breaches. Now, there's multiple ways to achieve that, but what I want to tell you today is how we've uh, achieved that in the Microsoft engineering focusing on Azure DevOps. As many companies, we've started with classic red-blue war games to learn attacks and practice responses. But over time, we've ended up eliminating the blue team and shifting even this part left, which means that now is the engineering team that directly takes care of it. And this approach has helped us preventing some of the most common issues like vulnerabilities in open source dependencies, secret leaks, credential theft, and others. Let's move on and let's quickly take a look at the general definition of DevOps. The definition that in my opinion best represents DevOps is this one from Donovan Brown. DevOps is the union of people, processes, and products to enable continuous delivery of value to your end users. People, processes, and products are the pillars of DevOps. And so, to have the maximum benefits and results out of DevSecOps, we need to find and apply techniques to each of those three pillars. For once, let's start with the products, which can also be referred to as technologies or tools. There are many things that, of course, you can do on this pillar, and some of those are very dependent on your specific technological landscape, but others are universal. For example, automating as much as possible will take the human error off the equation, and also using infrastructure as code and config as code will ensure you reproducibility and security in the configuration as well. And of course, the usage of tools like static code analysis and application security testing, both static and dynamic, as soon as possible in the development cycle helps in identifying issues as quick as possible. And this is especially true if you run those tests in the pull request phase. And same considerations apply for other scan types like credential scanning or scanning for known vulnerabilities, either in code patterns or dependencies. But tools alone are not enough. You do need to have processes in place to support this. And those processes can be complex like secure development lifecycle, threat modeling, and the red blue team exercises, just to name a few, or simpler things like adopting code reviews across the whole organization, of course, in this case, with emphasis on the security of the code, limiting access to production, which should be virtually unexistent for non-automated tools, adopting progressing exposure, as I've mentioned before, and of course, doing regular security assessment. But once again, this is not enough. You can have the best tools in the market and the best processes defined, but if your people won't use those tools or follow those processes, you won't be successful. And for the people, all starts with the education. 
to let the teams embrace a security first mindset, to always assume breach and try to prevent it, and even for more basic things like protecting credentials, whether we are talking about some external service or environment credentials. People are, as always in DevOps, the most important part of the equation. So remember to invest in your people, invest in your teams, and in your company culture. And people are also very important when it comes to the selection of the tools, because you want to find tools that not only fit within your processes, but also that your people would want to actually use. You need, for example, to find tools that are developer friendly, and that means easy to use, fast, and reliable. If something requires a lot of effort or time to be used or run, then nobody will use it. And if it takes too long to execute, then your builds and CIs will slow down, impacting your cadence. Another thing you should look into is having tools that can be used both locally and in a CI system. This way, the developers can run those tools on their machines before even committing the code to the remote branches and open their pull requests. And since we are talking about security, the tools you use must have a very low false positive rate. You don't want to waste your time investigating hundreds of false positives. Lastly, since we're talking about cloud native development, remember to add to your pipeline the tools that are specific for your technologies and services. For example, if you develop in containers, remember to have in place both application scanning and container image scanning. This way you can ensure that there are no vulnerabilities in your hidden dependencies, meaning the dependencies that you might inherit from the container-based image itself and that all the policies are respected. If the container registry you use has an embedded security scanning capability, that's usually a good starting point. But also in this case, you probably want to have your images scanned as soon as possible in the development chain. And still talking about containers, there is something else that I want to talk about, and it's very often overlooked. I'm talking about the Kubernetes best practices validation and enforcement. There are just a few tools out there to do this, and in this slide you can see that tree just because it's the one I use the most and it's free, but in my opinion, it is an extremely important area. The whole concept is to prevent security issues in production by preventing Kubernetes misconfigurations from reaching production. And of course, you can do this manually via code reviews, for example, but code reviews are time consuming and also usually error prone. So if you can automate things like Kubernetes schema validation and the enforcement of best practices and policies over your Kubernetes manifests, then you will make sure that you can just focus on your application bits. And once again, ideally you should find a tool that works the same way in every scenario, including local development, and it is fast and reliable to maximize the benefits you can get from it. All right, let's wrap these up and let's recap what we've just seen. First off, remember that security is not just for security people or security teams, it should be everyone's responsibility. Apply security everywhere in every step of your software production flow and as early and as frequent as possible. This will maximize your chances to identify and solve security issues fast. Consider the three pillars of DevOps, people, processes, and products, and identify areas of improvement in each of them when it comes to security. They are all important and you need to have solutions for each and every of them. And choose the tools that people would actually want to use, fast, easy to use, and reliable. And finally, DevSecOps should be just DevOps. Security should be completely embedded into DevOps. So just make it so, and you'll soon see the benefits. All right, thanks for your time. I really hope you find this valuable. Feel free to contact me if you have questions. Just go to coderdave.io and you will find all my contacts there. Thanks again for your time, and I hope you enjoy the rest of CloudSec 2021. Bye.